They had their baseball caps on backwards and they were holding bats and they made us pull out all <gasps> of our inventory so they could start smashing no it. No way. Are you ready? All right, let's go. Manufacturing is sexy. Sounds crazy? Just wait. I'm Z Holly, host of The Art of Manufacturing. Your behind the scenes look at how people who make stuff are trying to make it in their industries. If you've ever wondered how to build a brand, a business, or just a better mousetrap, tune in and enjoy. Hey everyone, I'm so excited for our very first episode of season two of The Art of Manufacturing. Thanks for all the feedback. This season will be even better than the last. I've been super busy the last few months meeting inspiring founders and thought leaders, and I can't wait to share some of our conversations. We'll have more grit, more insights, more innovation and technology, and more crazy stories from entrepreneurs tackling their next big venture. This week, we're talking with Kelly Johnson, president of Ace Clearwater. She's turned her third-generation family business into a highly specialized contract manufacturer with clients like NASA and Boeing. She's been a huge advocate for the manufacturing industry in Washington and deals firsthand with the struggles and opportunities at the cutting edge of manufacturing. I was curious to hear what she's learned as her companies evolved from a little welding workshop into an aerospace manufacturing powerhouse. And boy, does she have some stories. I also wanted to hear about her recent meeting with Vice President Pence. We hear about that and a whole lot more on this week's episode of The Art of Manufacturing. Ace Clearwater is a third-generation family-owned business. We're a supplier to the aerospace industry. I've been the president since 1989, 90 time frame. Um, we're a discrete contract manufacturer. Uh, we don't have our own proprietary product. We build to our customer specifications. Our core competencies are in forming and welding of exotic materials, but we're a fully integrated enterprise. And our customers primarily are the OEMs, the Honeywells, the Lockheeds, Boeing, General Electric, Pratt Whitney. A lot of jargon in there. Like, what, what did that sound discreet? like? A lot of did that sound like a lot of jargon? <laughs> it did. <laughs> well, what do you mean by discreet contract manufacturer? Well, that's a good question. I think discreet is in the sense of, um, you know, we don't have an assembly line going. If you think about mass customization, is kind of what we do here. Uh, many of the products that we build have never been built before, um, and we are high mix, low volume. Um, so it really requires a lot of talent. What's an example of something that you are making right now? Uh, well, can we tell, tell everyone, <laughs> I, I can share, but we tell everyone that if um, it flies, we have parts on it. <laughs> so oftentimes we don't even know the programs that we're working on. Over the course of many years, we've started to get to know our customers in a level that um, perhaps we never really communicated with before. Uh, we really are becoming more partners with them now as opposed to just being a supplier. So they're bringing us on earlier in the process, which allows us to kind of um, identify the programs that we're going to be supporting. But some of the cool things that we build are, for example, we do the primary nozzle on the Apache helicopter. Mm. And what that component does is it diffuses the heat from the engine. So if there's any heat-seeking rockets, uh, they can't find it. In fact, the pilot is giving off more heat than the actual engine. Um, we build cool <laughs> things like the air scrubber for the space station. Mm, really? Then we do a lot of just sort of legacy parts that are really conventional, that are sort of engine components, you know, hot section ducting of both commercial and military aircraft. Are you doing these really esoteric parts because the alloys that are necessary for the heat are really hard to work with? Or mm -hmm. what's, what's your mm -hmm. specialty? Heat and weight. Uh -huh. So, okay. you know, we don't design the parts. Our customers designs the design and test the parts, and they come to us and say, hey, can you actually build this then? <laughs> um, but most of it is because these alloys that we work with are for either weight reduction or f because of the heat that's involved with their functionality. Mm. So how big is your company? We're a, small, we're a relatively small enterprise. We have um, just over 200 of the best men and women in the industry. Mm. We have three locations that are all within about a 10-mile radius of each other. So you're, you're a contract manufacturer. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about how contract manufacturing works and what's the business model? How, what would be the 
you know, price breakdown and how do people find you even? That's a really great question. You know, um, in some ways, we feel incredibly blessed and really fortunate that we're a key supplier to the aerospace industry. On the other hand, um, the barriers to entry for a lot of companies that may have a really great idea or a new product, it's really difficult for them to, you know, enter into this market. Um, And we've had a lot of conversations with our customers about, hey, you know, we might be doing a disservice to our industry by not allowing some of these newer, innovative companies to be a part of the supply chain. And so we've been working with our customers on that. They keep saying that in order to bring a new supplier in, it costs them a quarter of a million dollars and they have to reduce it by five suppliers. So the barrier to entry, like I said, is really tough. But I think, you know, we don't really... I want to understand that you said Mm -hmm. to bring on a new supplier, they have to reduce their supply chain by five suppliers? Yes. Why would that be? I have no idea. And it cost (laughs) them $250,000. Wow. That's, That's what we've been told. Yeah. I know. So, you know, we didn't, we, when we started off, we never really had a real business model. The company was founded by my grandfather, who learned the welding trade during uh, the Depression, a, a government work program. And uh, he served in the Korean War. And after the Korean War, he moved the family from Oklahoma to Southern California. So everyone says, sheer okey luck that he did that, <laughs> right? Because it was sort of the epicenter in the late 50s, early 60s yeah. for aerospace in California. And he really had, he probably didn't even know what the word manufacturing meant. He just knew that he was a <laughs> welder. He was a fix-it guy. He was a go-to repair man. And really, I think he thought that uh, he was going to take care of his family and make ends meet by just repairing, whether it's coffee pots or bicycle frames or things like that. And he got a lucky break from a friend of his at Aerojet that asked him to come down and bid on a job on the spot. And so he bid on a little um, engine igniter. It was a screen assembly, and that's how you would light rockets at the time. 13 cents a piece on the spot. And the buyer said, well, who do I make the purchase order out to? And my grandfather had no name of the company. (laughs) So he just off the top of his head said Ace Welding. And so Ace Welding was born. And over time, my father took over the business and he was really the entrepreneur. But his business model, I guess, was to be able to control our own destiny. So therefore, we had to bring all of these processes in-house. So we kind of evolved from just being a welding shop and doing piecemeal stuff to acquiring a machine shop, a tube bending shop. And then probably the largest acquisition came when we purchased Clearwater Tool and Die. Mm. And then that allowed us to not only be putting together details for other companies, but we could form our own details that allowed us to move up the food chain and get involved in more complex components. So you're not a stereotypical entrepreneur. I mean, you've actually taken over your family business. And I'm curious, how did that come about? Um, And when... And what is it like to have taken over for your dad and try to follow in his footsteps? So I I think that first we have to, you know, entrepreneur can be defined in many different ways. And so when you think about when I took over the business in the late 80s, early 90s, our industry was going through a significant amount of change. Our customers were downsizing their supply chain. Um, You had to meet certain metrics in order to be given new opportunities. There was a lot of change going, so we had to reinvent ourselves. And I think that's sort of being an entrepreneur. And um, I was the first one in my family to go to college, and my parents, didn't really know how to provide the right guidance. I just knew I was so incredibly fortunate to continue on to get a four-year degree. And I just, like most people, wanted to make a difference and wanted to change the world. And Those got Im- silly young people uh, have this, that right. deals, right? Exactly. <laughs> so um, I studied international relations and political science, thinking I was going to be foreign service, something exotic like that. <laughs> if not foreign service, maybe I wanted to be an ambassador to like <laughs> France or Italy or something. No, parties. parties. Right. <laughs> Realized, you know, I was going to just get caught up in this huge government bureaucracy and it didn't really feel right to me. So I thought, I'm going to help people. And so I applied for a master's program in clinical social work. And while I was doing that, I was working at Ace Clearwater, which I've been working at Ace throughout my entire life during the summers as you know, a young person. And I was working here almost full time. And I'll never forget just standing out in the parking lot one day looking at all of these new cars and thinking, you know, my golly, 
here our family business is providing these great careers where people can go buy new cars or a home or put their kids through school. What am I doing? You know, why not carry on a family legacy, support an industry where the United States is still a global leader and provide these amazing careers to these awesome people. Hmm. So that's really how it came about. And when we talk about you know, manufacturing and kind of our society, and we've sort of discounted it over the last couple decades, trying to encourage everyone to go to a four-year degree and not really recognizing the kind of amazing careers that exist in a, a manufacturing enterprise. And coming from a manufacturing family, my parents didn't encourage me to go into the business if anyone at should, all. it would be them. Exactly, right? I will yeah. never forget the la- one of the last conversations I had with my mom. Um, we were coming back from one of those Revlon breast cancer walks. We're sitting in the bus heading back home, and she's like, I often wonder, you know, what your career would have been like if you had stayed in school, <laughs> you know, pursuing that master's. And you and quit. Being, and so I quit. Know? Right. And she never really forgave me for it. But you have to understand, (laughs) she came from uh, a perspective that she either wanted me to be a doctor or marry the president of the United States. (laughs) So the idea of me going into, quote, a man's world, right, dark and dirty and dangerous, you know, she had other aspirations for her daughter. So (laughs) I've always sort of felt like I let her down big time and, you know, but for me, it satisfies me on so many levels. Well, I have to say that I'm really nervous about this next generation. There's so many companies, when we did our survey of local manufacturers, the average age of the companies are 25 years old. You know, I mean, there are a lot of companies run by folks that are about to retire. Absolutely. What's going to happen? I know. So I look at the demographics of our company and 50% of our employees fall in the ages of 45 to 65. Mm. So long before this recession, we were starting to see the writing on the wall. Everyone going to a four-year university or college, um, no one really getting involved in the trades, a lot of the high schools getting rid of their career technical education programs, community colleges just sort of floundering out there, like who are we going to serve if everyone's going to these four-year schools? So we really embraced sort of workforce development and addressing the skills gap long before it became like Hmm. topic of vogue, right? Right. I mean, everyone's talking about it now. So it's topic of vogue now. What are we doing about it in general? And what, what, what are you doing about it and what can others do? Well, we've done a lot. You know, we've, um, over the last decade, we've created some really great partnerships with schools, both high schools and community colleges and universities. And we host on Manufacturing Day, which is the first Friday mm-hmm. in October every year. You do the most rockin' Manufacturing we, Day. <laughs> oh, and, and you weren't here last year. You were here the previous yeah. year, right? So last year, we doubled down on it. When you came and visited us on Manufacturing Day, I think we had a little over 300 students that attended. So last year, our goal was to double that. So we had over 600 students Whoa. this past year. So we're going to dial back, I think, this mm-hmm. year and make it a little bit more exclusive for those that are really serious because the educational system is doing a lot more to encourage young people to get in manufacturing careers. We've seen firsthand the kind of programs that exist now in community colleges that didn't exist before. In fact, that's where we most of our recruiting comes from are the community colleges. Same with the high schools. So in addition to hosting Manufacturing Day, we also provide paid internship programs. We have tours We have tours for high school students, middle school students, and community college students. We just are doing a lot to get our name out there. For example, when we first set up our website many, many years ago, um, before anyone really knew what you're supposed to do with a website, it's like, (laughs) well, why are we doing this? We knew we had to kind of stay on the forefront Mm -hmm. of where the world was going. But what purpose was it going to serve? We're not selling anything on the Internet. (laughs) You know, we're completely regulated because we're in an aerospace industry. So it's like, you know, it's sort of a private little community. Why do we have a website? And all the purpose was at the time was to attract people to come work here. Mm. for people to see our website and go, oh, that's a really cool place. I would like to go work there. Mm. So we've always been really sensitive and very aware of the fact that 
a lot of people have this outdated perception of manufacturing and we're convinced that we have to communicate with the general public that manufacturing isn't a relic of the past, but it's sort of a path for a really prosperous future. Mm -hmm. And you know, when jobs are the number one issue on everybody's mind, we know as manufacturers, we're a known and proven solution. We're not a bubble. (laughs) We're not a tech bubble, a housing bubble, a financial bubble. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps we've done a disservice by trying to chase consumers around the world by then, you know, setting up factories in other countries. But I think the public, and I've always believed this, that if we can get the public behind what we're doing and help them to understand what manufacturing is all about, there's no stopping us. I mean, you don't have to do this to your company to be successful. You've always been very giving of your time in this, and you've been really involved in policy uh, as well, um, done a lot of advocacy. You're in Washington recently talking mm-hmm. to Vice President Pence. Is yeah. that right? How did that go? It was, well, it was just a huge honor, you know, when you have the opportunity to meet someone, that level of a new administration. But it was super exciting. You know, the NAM has a very clear agenda for manufacturers in the United States. NAM? Being, NAM, the National Association yeah. of Manufacturers. And so they have a very clear agenda for the competitiveness of manufacturing in the United States. And it was super refreshing and very exciting to meet uh, Vice President-elect Pence at the time to see that their priorities were in alignment with uh, the NAM's agenda. Mm -hmm. So what was some of the advice? Well, they're they're totally supportive of one, uh, our infrastructure improving our infrastructure. And I know from coming from the aviation world, we know that we have a really outdated air control system. People don't really talk about that much. We talk about potholes and bridges Mm -hmm. and things like that, which are all really necessary to our competitiveness when we think about the goods that we're moving and how they have to get from one location to the next. So infrastructure is big. If we're talking about jobs, you know, right there, that's an immediate... Not quite sure shovel ready, but Mm. we could get to business pretty quickly. Um, In addition to that is really kind of taking a look from a common sense perspective about the kind of regulations that we have to comply with. And, you know, all of us, especially in California, know that regulations can be very burdensome, complex, redundant don't necessarily live up to their promises and that we need to step back sometimes and have a sunset review to see, hey, are we really getting what we wanted out of this? It's a real balance, right? Because I mean, it's nice to have clean air. I remember Uh, back in the 70s how terrible the smog was. That's exactly right. Um, And I think, you know, that's the thing when we're trying to change the image of manufacturing. A lot of that has to do with most of us that work in manufacturing, you know, live in the same communities and we don't want dirty water or dirty air. And um, part of it is sort of a a learning curve that we go through in terms Mm -hmm. of, you know, sustainability is a big issue now. And it used to be a bad word. Mm -hmm. What does sustainability mean? And now we recognize Mm -hmm. that we have sustainable practices in place that can actually really help our bottom line. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two different types. Well, there's many different kinds of policies. There's the regulatory policies, obviously, that can be really challenging for manufacturers. There's also trade policy which impacts California Mm -hmm. companies in particular. How does that impact you? Well, we don't, all of the products that we sell are in the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, there's very little that we ship overseas. Mm -hmm. You know, Mexicali, but one of our largest customers is Honeywell, and they have a large factory in Mexicali. So a lot of the components that we build will go straight down there to then be assembled. So trade isn't a big issue of mine because we're not trying to reach 90% of the consumers that are outside of the United States. But I can tell you that colleagues of mine that do export, there's a huge advantage being here on the West Coast and us being able to look just even symbolically to look over at Asia and some of these markets that we're trying to tap into. So Mm -hmm. I think the administration believes in fair and free trade and that I don't think they want to demolish it at all. They're, you know, I know that the NAM, they are huge advocates for trade, but I think the administration, after a little further education, they'll be looking at some of these trade opportunities in maybe through a different lens and they're looking out for, you know, really the benefit of U.S. manufacturers so that we're not at a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. And what are your thoughts on the uh, the whole debate about, will we bring the jobs back? <laughs> well, I don't think we're ever going to bring all the jobs back that perhaps we lost. But I think the kind of jobs that we're creating right now, 
we can't even really define what they are. I mean, technology is moving so quickly and I really believe that it's manufacturing's moment with the intersection of manufacturing and technology. And you know, we are a traditional manufacturer that are really embracing disruptive technologies. And I think that that's just going to help us become more competitive. And the types of jobs that come along with these disruptive technologies are gonna be different than the jobs Mm -hmm. that we lost over the last couple decades. So I want to talk a little bit more about that workforce later, but let's go into that whole, the trends. You know, what are you the most excited about? You are really embracing a lot of these industry 4.0 mm-hmm. kind of technologies. So mm-hmm. uh, tell us, what, first of all, what is industry well, 4.0? Well, I feel like kind of it, the, some of the things that we've done, I feel like we're already, you know, getting behind the curve <laughs> instead of staying out in front of the curve. And it's really being able to try to find that balance. Mm. As I mentioned about, you know, initially when we started our website many, many years ago, it was like, it was just something that we had to do. So you put your toe in your water and you kind of see where it goes. One of the most recent disruptive technologies that we brought in house was our additive manufacturing or 3D printing. And we, quite honestly, the first one we bought was relatively small and inexpensive, and we really did it for our engineers here so they could see where it was going and maybe how we could use that application in our processes. It went from really being like a toy and something fun to play around mm-hmm. with or a giveaway to the students when we came through you know, with the tours, and here, take this from Ace, and it'd be something that we printed, um, mm-hmm. to now we have a very large one that we have found really innovative ways, you know, we can't build our parts from additive manufacturing because our customers determine what materials we're gonna be making these products in. So it's like, okay, so why do we have a 3D printer if we can't make a part from it? Well, we can make trim templates. Everything's Mm -hmm. model-based. So we're Mm -hmm. living in this digital economy now. So Mm -hmm. we went, we used to tell everyone, we went from building to a blueprint, building to data, and now we build to models. So with that, We do, now we're doing trim templates, we're doing weld fixtures, we're doing rapid prototyping, so when we're negotiating a new program with our customers, we can talk about where there might be thinning out of materials or we might have a hard time meeting that spec or that dimension, so. You know, the next step is we're involved with the National Center for Manufacturing Sciences, NCMS, and we're working with them on developing some sensors that we can put on our welding equipment. Mm. Since welding is one of our core competencies and we do TIG welding, so it's all by hand, we we find that, you know, a lot of our defects come from welding and we're not really quite sure why, if it's the environment we're welding it in, if it's the gas is contaminated, or if the operator just doesn't have the technique or our tooling's not right. So we're going to put sensors on some of our welding equipment to see what kind of data we can get out of that so we can start to eliminate the causes of defects. Amazing. That's really cool. So how do you decide which technologies to be investing in at this point? And what are you the most excited about? In addition, is that really kind of the next next thing that you're excited about? Well, that's kind of the next thing. And trust me, everything we do, I mean, there's a lot of failure that's built into <laughs> all of this. One of the first um, things that we tried doing was actually with USC. It was a DARPA program. And they, were, they reached out to us because we have developed these relationships and partnerships with the schools. They reached out to us and said, you know, we want to get involved in hyper performance computing. And we want to take that capability that all the big guys have and kind of build that bridge to the small guys so they could start using it. Okay, that was a complete failure. (laughs) We never even got past the language barrier, okay? I mean, it was so far over our head. And it's like, really, how is that going to apply to us? But what was interesting about that journey is USC wanted to document kind of our evolution from quote, going from the dark ages to now high performance computing. So they brought in some of their animators from their film school to create this video. And we recognize the software that the animators are using is similar to the software that our tool designers and programmers use. And we thought, you know, not all these animators are going to go work at Disney or Pixar Mm -hmm. or wherever. And maybe they don't want to live in a virtual world all their life. Maybe they want to be a part of making something really tangible. So we got this crazy idea to form a production company called Dash 9 Productions. And this goes back to workforce. The purpose of forming that production company was we wanted to make videos all about knowledge transfer. Mm. So as companies struggle to find welders or machinists and programmers, inspectors, Imagine how difficult it would be to find a drop hammer operator Mm. 
Mm. Now, this forming technique of drop hammering goes back to like the 20s, and mm-hmm. it's manual, and it, you, it's really, you have to be a true artisan, a real craftsperson, and mm. understand how metal moves, um, you know, how, and it's all sort of like a black art. And what our drop hammer operators will do is create their own notebook. So even though we have engineering planning that travels with the part as it's being manufactured, which are the work instructions for our technicians on the floor, the drop hammer planning would say, you know, hit once, send it out to a kneel, second hit, send it out. So, but they would have all their like secret sauce in their notebook. <laughs> Five inches of uh, rubber on one side, an inch on the other, lightly tap, then hit it hard. So we thought, we speak about 95 different languages in this company. We have a very <laughs> diverse workforce. So we thought a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's make some of these knowledge transfer videos using the animators from USC. Oh, cool. So that's something that we're embarking on. We're in our infancy stages. We've created about five of them. And we mm-hmm. probably have 5,000 of them to do. But And they're all just for internal use? They're all for internal use. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had grand ambitions at one time that, you know, we were going to sell this service to other manufacturers that are struggling with this whole knowledge transfer as well. But uh, our place pretty full in terms of what we just need to do for mm-hmm. our own internal mm-hmm. purposes. Mm-hmm. You're listening to The Art of Manufacturing. Join the conversation on social at We Make It in LA and our Facebook group, makeitinla.org slash community. We'll be right back after this break. I want to give a shout out to Happily, a nationwide network of the best freelance event producers, coordinators, and assistants. They can take on the biggest or smallest of projects. They're a sponsor of the Make It Monthly Talks, and I've personally worked with the team on everything from high-level strategy to nitty-gritty on-site logistics, and they're great. If your company is looking for long-term or last-minute support on events, go to makeitinla.org slash happily, and you'll get a 30% discount on your first six months of membership in 2017. We're speaking with Kelly Johnson, president of Ace Clearwater, who's gone through crazy struggles and triumphs while scaling her aerospace manufacturing business. So I was wondering if you could... Tell us a little bit about how you actually became the CEO of Ace Clearwater. Yeah, when did that happen? My typical father, okay. <laughs> I blame it all on him. As I mentioned earlier, he is truly an entrepreneur, and he ran everything by his guts. And even to this day, he could walk into final inspection and look at a part and say, mm, it's about 500 bucks, and be pretty close to what our selling price is you know I mean he wow. just is just he's just made that way he's truly a real entrepreneur so Boeing in the late 80s was experiencing a strike they had huge production volumes that they had to meet so what they did was offloaded all the work that they were building internally to the supply chain in Southern California without doing a really good job in assessing what the capacity and what kind of constraints might exist In addition, these parts had never been built outside of Boeing before, and the incentive to get the tools and everything down into the suppliers wasn't really there. So we were awarded a huge contract that basically doubled our company in size overnight, Mm. and we went from about 120 employees to 275 instantly. Wow. We had more than 30 Boeing personnel sort of parked here. (laughs) We're working 24-7. Whoa. And, and were you um, still in grad school at this point? No. Okay, I so was working, working at ACE in production control mm-hmm. and um, managing all of this and um, way over my head, <laughs> way, way, way. <laughs> and I'll never forget uh, two directors from Boeing coming down from Seattle and meeting with me and my dad in his office and them telling us, unless you put someone of ownership on our program, you're never going to do business with Boeing again. Hmm. And I think what they meant was they really wanted my dad to take over, but he looked at it and was like, oh, heck no. (laughs) You want it, Kelly? It's all yours. (laughs) And I thought he was sort of joking until the next day I got a call from our primary buyer and he congratulated me on being president. (laughs) (laughs) And so I was definitely drinking from a fire hose. And I will never forget our very first Boeing program review. I went up there and there was probably... 30 people sitting around a very large conference table and I went on to explain to them our org chart 
and all they really wanted was recovery schedules. <laughs> and I will never forget them after the formal meeting, five gentlemen took me into an office and sat me down and said, you'll never make it happen. Oh my You're God. never going to succeed. This is a complete failure. I have goosebumps hearing that. <laughs> I, I, I'm just sitting, they're all standing, right? I'm just sitting there like, oh. oh. And how old were you? I was 30. Yeah. That's harsh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. 29, yeah. So just, what, was, what was going through your head at that time? Oh, I was determined to succeed. Nice. <laughs> determined to succeed. I just remember thinking to myself, I'll show you, I'll show you, <laughs> I will show you. And so a really proud moment for me and our entire team was a couple years later, we won uh, the Boeing Supplier of the Year Award for Purchased Outside Parts. So wow. that, was, that was a great experience. That's so cool. So did you have, um, other than that, obviously, but you know, early on with a team, did you have trouble with credibility or anything? I could just imagine, you know, they oh. are all listening to your father, um, who, you weren't an engineer. I wasn't an engineer. <laughs> I wasn't a business major. <laughs> uh, it was pretty rough initially to start with. And so what, before I became the president in the late 80s, early 90s, I was working in production control. And at that time, there were only two women in the business at Ace Clearwater, I should say. Um, myself and another woman that we affectionately referred to as Dragon Lady. <laughs> and she was the one that handled, you know, payables, receivables, benefits, and, you know, guarded the cash like a hawk. And imagine this, Z, that the shop floor in those days, the girly posters were in front of every <laughs> work I set, remember those. And, um, cigarettes hanging out of the mouth, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and these were a bunch of good old boys that were part of my dad's team. And I'm like, hey, I got an open door policy. I want your ideas. I want uh, all of us. And so before I knew it, I would have a line out my door and I, every day as like somersaults and backflips and I was entertaining them. So it was really, really hard because at first I think they thought daddy's little girl she's not going to be here long eventually she'll Mm -hmm. get married and she'll just be gone and this is just you know sort of a passing fancy so it took a lot of hard work a lot of commitment a lot of tough decisions um but it it all worked out women uh were not really in manufacturing at the time they were just starting to move up the ranks in some of the larger companies the boeings for example and i was really disheartened I fell for a lot of the women in sort of the buying positions of saying, hey, we got each other's back, you know, we're in this together, to find out that we really weren't. Mm. And they they wanted to be the only girl in the boys club mm. and didn't want anyone else kind of on their territory. Mm. That's um, an interesting and, transition point, right? Where there's nobody, then there's one. And then once there's more than Maybe maybe there's three, and then then it changes again. Right. Because I feel like things right. are very different now. Very different now. Yeah. Man, I, I remember back in the day. Back in mm-hmm. my day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my first job started as a summer job on the Space Shuttle main engine, and a guy actually came up to me and said, you should be glad that you're a woman, because my friend applied for this job, too. And he just left it there. And I'm like, really? Interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so that's like, how that it's like it had nothing to do with your capability. Right, exactly. Right. Uh-huh. I'm like, yeah. um, okay, and I'm an right. engineer from MIT, and right. I actually have some capability. And then by the end of the summer, they're like, oh, you're actually doing some really cool stuff, and oh, your thing was written up in tech briefs, and you know, so I think it changed a little bit. But mm-hmm. man, did it! Sometimes you got to prove yourself, and it's very frustrating. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. When I think back on the evolution of Ace from when I first started to where we are today. As I said, it was just myself and Dragon Lady at the time. (laughs) Um, And now I look at our organization and we have women in every key function. Mm -hmm. We have a woman that's running our drop hammer facility in Paramount. Our senior engineer is a woman, you know, HR, contracts, program management, welding, NDT. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and I don't know how that came about. It wasn't really intentional. It was just trying to find the best talent mm-hmm. and that would fit in with our culture. Yeah, yeah. Although a lot of people say there's a pipeline problem. I mean, you can look for the good talent, but if they're not interested or they're not, right. so I don't know how much of that is a factor right now. 
It's um, a big factor. Yeah. You know, and it's something that we're constantly promoting, whether it's the STEP Awards for women in manufacturing to inspire the next generation. You know, I think we still continually have to work on this outdated perception that so many people have about manufacturing. Mm. And what our teams do are super cool. The products that we make, when you think about manufacturing across this country, they protect our nation and our communities, these products, they strengthen our economy, they improve our quality of life. And how many people can actually say they made something today? I know. (laughs) And that's what we're finding with this next generation is that they've lived in this virtual world for so long that there's this real sense of satisfaction to get away from behind their computer and out on the shop floor and then have something to show for what they did that day. Maybe that's the fascination hipsters have with making pickles and like, exactly. whatever, no, right? I, I, Yeah. It's like making mm-hmm. stuff. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about this passion project you have, uh, tell, you know, where you're trying to create that community around makers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So we have this thing, ideas become real at the point of action. So it's still sort of in the idea mode, even though we have built out these sites. What we're doing, we created um, a social media site for all the men and women that are in manufacturing. And we've named it Makers Nation. And Makers is spelled M-A-K, the E is more a three and an R, mm-hmm. S. So we have Makers Nation in front, and that's sort of the umbrella that holds this whole social networking site together. And then we have eight other sites that are a part of it that we're building out. We have networkers and leaders and bloggers and teachers, explorers. And the whole idea was to initially was to create that pipeline for the next generation of manufacturing workforce. But in addition, and probably more importantly, What we are trying to accomplish with this is to create a community where people that are in manufacturing feel safe, they feel appreciated, they feel that they can share with their other peers, wherever they may be, about the cool stuff that they're making and the projects that Mm -hmm. they're working on. And then we also know that, you know, manufacturing is truly about lifelong learning. With technology coming online in the manufacturing enterprises and things moving so quickly, we have to constantly stay engaged and continue to further our careers through education. So what this site does as well is hook schools up with people that are lurking to get a certificate in a certain process. It also allows companies that are hiring to then put that out there to the manufacturing community. It gives young people a chance to explore and learn online. So they're learning about manufacturing early on as opposed to waiting to high school or community college when they're trying to figure out what they want to do with themselves. Mm. So we're going to see where it goes. It was, I think, a super great idea. And I still believe passionately in it, but it's super ambitious. (laughs) So we're looking now at how do we you know, find some founders, mm-hmm. you know, who, who can be a part of the founders that are going to help finance a little bit of it. And the whole idea is not to make profit off it, that whatever profit we get um, goes back into whether it's internships or something that like that we keep giving back to the manufacturing community. But um, it's in its early stages and we're still pretty excited about it. But I have to tell you between the Dash 9 and that and the amount of work that we have we're pretty busy. Mm-hmm. I would think so. So all this education that people need, the workforce development and all that training, because everything's changing so quickly, one of the things that I hear a lot about from the community colleges is we need to be going where the puck is going, right? right? So how do we know what those needs are and how can they want to connect more to the manufacturers? How do they learn what to be teaching? You know, that's a great question, Z, because the um, instructors, teachers that we bring through our factory, many of them have never been on a factory floor before. They have no idea the kind of careers that exist. So it's a a lot of it educating them as well. But what we have found is that with the retirement of all the baby boomers that is beginning, boy, the kind of industries that community colleges are servicing, we're competing against now, healthcare being one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, automotive is a different because that's changed so radically. You Mm -hmm. know, you don't work on an engine like you used to. It's a computer, basically. So from automotive. (laughs) I remember when you could actually work on your own car. And smell that oil. (laughs) I know. Now it's like, hmm? 
So, and construction, we compete against that. As, so that's why we got to get our foot in the door first with our schools that are nearby us, and bring them into our factory so they can see, talk about the open positions that we have, the kind of career paths that exist, the kind of, you know, curriculum that mm-hmm. they should be teaching. I think we're making some progress, but we still have a, a long way to go. One of the biggest challenges, I think, with concern about automation and AI taking jobs and uh, is the the displacement of folks that are later in their careers. And it's harder for them, I think, to get their head around having to retrain. Who are the people that you're hiring now? What What's their profile? Where do you find them? They're young, they're in their 20s, mm-hmm. and they're primarily from community colleges or trade schools. Mm-hmm. So wow, if you're like a 55-year-old that's being displaced by it's tough. a robot, what are you gonna do? Mm-hmm. Especially if you're in a place where there's only one company, maybe it's a company town, or I mean, LA at least, it's very diverse. There's a lot of different options. Right, but I don't think we should generalize that robots are going to replace (laughs) people. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not gonna replace our innovation, our creativity, our ability to really think and solve problems. And so even though companies are progressing and embracing new technologies, we still have that need for sort of the foundation of you know whatever that particular process might be so then we can take it to the next level. And I think that companies, you know, at least here, we really value the men and women that have been around a long time and really know, I mean, we have a gentleman here, his, he goes by Lucky, He's truly a legend in our industry. And he started off as a drop hammer operator. And his father was a drop hammer operator before him. And then he moved on at Garrett Air Research and got into management positions. And he's been working for us for more than 25 years now. But he's invaluable. He's priceless. When we talk about forming some kind of exotic material and him understanding how it could thin out or what happens when the when the heat affected zones and those are things that a lot of young people coming out of school don't are clueless about mm-hmm. you know and it's going to take a lot of time so I think it's really kind of finding that balance with the old and with the new aggressive mm-hmm. kind of attitude <laughs> that we're starting to see mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we talked a lot about industry 4.0 and how how it's really revolutionizing. And and just to explain, so the industry 1.0 was the mechanization, right? Industry 2.0, assembly line, right three dot more mm-hmm. like the that's that's sort of where the automation started actually exactly it's not that new in mm-hmm. a way. And now we're talking about the connected enterprise and exactly. sensors and all that. I can imagine that a lot of listeners who are entrepreneurs that maybe are in I mean, you've even touched on this, right? Small company, even smaller. Maybe they're only 20 people. How do they take advantage of that? Or is it is there a certain size at which it makes sense to even be thinking about it? Is it possible to be part of Industry 4.0 if you're just a, a startup or a small company? How do people get involved? I think, I think it is possible, and I think it's just all how you define it. Mm-hmm. I've never really believed in just sort of straight textbook information that everything is sort of customized to your enterprise or your organization. So for example, they talk about big data and analytics and product visualization and cloud computing. And in fact, we're going to have a a woman from Siemens come by tomorrow to talk about an initiative that they have that they want to get to the small medium manufacturers. And I'm just sort of like, well, we already have our ERP system in. We already have all of our traceability in place. We're, you know, building our products from our customer CAD models. Um, These words all sound great, but how did you know, how does it really apply to us? So I don't think that you should take something and go, oh, this is the trend that the industry is going, therefore I need to embrace all of it. I think you just sort of pick apart the components that fit both your organization, your processes, and your culture. And if you really have the capacity and the resources internally to manage it all, because you can go out and say we're doing all the high performance computing, for example, right? Mm-hmm. And we're not, right? <laughs> so I wouldn't be intimidated by it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And do some of your employees end up going and starting their own companies? They do. And that's something that I'm really proud of. I mean, 
yeah, we hate to see them leave, but at the same time, it's all about pursuing that American dream. Mm -hmm. You know, so many people that I know want to be in charge of their own destiny to the best of their ability, and they have a good idea, and they see an opportunity, and they go for it. And we've had, you know, numerous companies that have kind of spun off from Ace Clearwater as small as we are. You know, we had a gentleman that left us many years ago to start his own tube bending shop because he saw that we didn't have really the capacity to be doing some of these tube assemblies that were being awarded uh, by Boeing. Mm. So he said, hey, I'll become your vendor. Mm. And he went and started his own shop. And from there he grew and acquired other customers. A gentleman that was in charge of our in in process inspection, he left to go start his own inspection company. And he invested then into some technology that was very, very expensive and very complicated and sophisticated to use. We didn't have the resources in house to do it. So we farm our work out to him now. That's a goal. Yeah, it's really cool. That's and what it's, it's all about. creating that ecosystem that's really connected mm-hmm. and uh, supporting each other. Mm-hmm. I think there's just something really, really important about, about our ability to make things. And um, we're sort of kindred spirits and you come across other folks that kind of have that in their DNA. It's sort of a classic American notion of freedom, prosperity, and security. Mm -hmm. To me, that's what it's all about. What's the craziest story from when you were running from the past? How how many how years have you been running? Know, too many. <laughs> <laughs> a really long time. <laughs> like, well, you you did tell me one story about uh, GE. Oh yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't want to. No, I'm going to get myself in trouble maybe here. No, this goes back. Well, there's a story. This is a pretty wild story. This has to do with Boeing. We had a source inspector come in here, and she wasn't happy with our performance and was really in an ornery mood and said, you know what, I'm going to audit you guys tomorrow, and I don't want you to change one thing on your shop floor between now and tomorrow morning. (laughs) So she sent a team in, and honestly, they went through every nook and cranny of our organization, even down to the plexiglass that was on our pressure test tank, that it wasn't certified. We ended up that day with about 42 write-ups. Mm. And so they, Boeing ultimately disqualified us from their quality system. Mm. It was a huge blow. Mm. And we went up there and made a presentation to them saying, We got all of our corrective actions in place. They bought everything off. They approved everything that we did to fix the problems. And they said, well, we're still not going to do business with you guys. (laughs) We're like, okay, well, we guarantee that in three months from now, we're going to be ISO AS9100 certified. And they said, why is it every time you open your mouth, it sounds like birds are chirping? (laughs) Now, if that wasn't enough to incentivize us to make sure that we got our certification in three months. So we did, and we were super (laughs) proud. In fact, our director of progress, King, gave me this little peanut that when you open it up, there's a bird inside chirping. (laughs) I have it to this day. But so what Boeing said, you guys are decertified. You're not going to do business with us anymore. All the parts that you have in inventory, you have to destroy. Oh We're God. not going to buy them. What percentage of your business was Boeing? It wasn't that large at that time, but yeah. it was still huge. I mean, oh. th- you know, yeah. they're the oh, big yeah. guy, right? Oh, yeah. you know? And we're like, seriously. They came in, a team of Boeing people. They had their baseball caps on backwards, and they were holding bats. And they made us pull out all <gasps> of our inventory so they could start smashing no it. No way. Yeah. So we start taking pictures of it all, like, what is happening? I mean, you know, there's no rules here. No, there's no guidance. So we're not, we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. So we started taking pictures, and they said, you can't take pictures of us. And we're like, you're on our property. You're de- destroying our hardware. We can't. Wow. So they called someone in legal, and we got on the phone with them, and they eventually all left. And we said, okay, if you want us to destroy the hardware, we will. We rented a steamroller. <laughs> and we let all of our employees <laughs> drive it. Oh my God. Oh, it's so tragic. Oh, just the we idea. We saved three. We used to make these hydraulic reservoirs for the 737. Mm-hmm. We saved three of them. But we knew we had them. So maybe six months later, they call us. 
we sold them to him <laughs> at a very high price. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, so crazy. There's been so many crazy stories over time, but you know, those kind of memories really bond you as an organization, Right. you know? We're like, no one's gonna bring us down. It really makes you tight, a really mm -hmm. tight-knit organization that I think you can only have, you know, in a small enterprise like What's this. What's the average tenure of a person working here? Oh my golly. I don't know that off the top of my head, but I know that every year we recognize people that have been here over 20 years, and there's some people that have been here 40. Oh my God, that's amazing. We have one gentleman that's still running our one of our drop hammers, and he's close to 80. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to lose him. Oh my. I know. Yeah. Wow, crazy. You don't want to tell the story about when you almost were thrown in jail? No. <laughs> no. That was a scary lawyer meeting. Okay. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Okay. You're all so curious. So curious. Okay. Tell me about your 16-year-old self and what she would think about you today. I think she would like her. Where'd you go to school? Where'd you grow up? In, uh, in Manhattan Beach. In Manhattan Beach. So I went to gen, uh, elementary, junior high, and high school in Manhattan Beach. Uh, and then I went to USC for college. And... I think the 16-year-old would be probably pretty surprised in one hand, and then on the other, not quite so much. Mm -hmm. I had really no aspirations to enter into the family business at that age. I think all I really wanted to do was travel. Hmm. So, Hence the um, international relations degree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, was, I just enjoyed traveling and... Um, not really quite sure what I wanted to do. The world seems so big. Mm -hmm. And it's how am I going to make a difference in this big world? Why do I matter? Mm -hmm. And so the advice I give young kids is like, you just got to start something. You just got to get involved. And if you like it, you'll create your own world. And you will make a difference. And so you think about how many manufacturers we have in this country and all the various sizes and what they do. And like, well, does Ace Clearwater really make a difference? And I'll tell you a story. So oftentimes we kind of lose sight of what we do here because we don't have our own proprietary product because we do build our customer specs and we're not often quite sure where these parts go or how they function. We build this really cool CO2 scrubber, which is kind of an air cleaner mm -hmm. for the space station. It's a component that goes into mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's basically a 40-week lead time item. Makes it, it's, yeah, long, very complex. It's an intense part that we mm -hmm. build. And they were had a scheduled launch, and two of the devices at the space station had failed, not with our part, but just in general. I don't remember the reasons why. And so they contacted us to say, we have a scheduled launch. We need to get another one of your parts up there, be a part of this launch. Can you guys pull it off? So we went from, we are already starting the build process of this product, but it's a 40 week lead item. We got it down to 12 weeks. Whoa. And I mean, it was a 24 seven, our team just <laughs> pulling together, cots here, do whatever it takes. We're gonna make it happen. We're not gonna let these guys down. Mm -hmm. So we pulled it off and we had an astronaut come and visit us to thank us. Aww. So he gave a whole presentation to our company about the mission, about what they do, uh, took pictures with everyone and assigned autograph. And I think that really drove home to our employees here the importance of what we do every single day. It's not even around the world, but it's up in space. It's up in space. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, amazing. I, I ask everyone three questions. So here, we, here goes. So the first one is, what's, what's kind of the next big milestone and what does that success look like for you on the horizon? From a professional standpoint? Either way, really. Well, I think my next big milestone is what I'm going to do in my next chapter in life. Mm. That's kind of what I'm struggling with right now. I'm struggling with succession planning mm -hmm. in our company, trying to, I've been involved in manufacturing my whole life. So it's like, what else is it that I want to do? which is why we wanted to launch this Makers Nation. For me, that was kind of a legacy that I could leave behind for the manufacturing community. But I'm also, you know, a really an outdoors person and belong to the board of directors for the Catalina Island Conservancy. And oh, I spent my summers as a kid on Catalina. Really? Yes. We just finished building a home. 
Really? Yeah, it took oh, us three can years. I come visit? <laughs> of course, of course, we love visitors, and that's oh, why we built it. Nice. I'll take you to the interior. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, what I can do there, what I want to do with the next 30, 40 years that I have, where I can be really productive. And it's very important to me that I leave Ace Clear Water in really good hands. And I'm not really quite sure what that means. So mm. once I kind of figure out what. Ace Clearwater's future is going to be, then perhaps it allows me then to figure out what my next chapter personally is going to be. But that's really where I'm at in my life right now. I think you kind of answered the second question in a way is what's what's keeping you up at night <laughs> doing that? <laughs> now, how I'm going to pay for that house we built in Galilee? Okay. <laughs> I guess I'll, the last one is if there's one thing you wish you had known in your early days, starting, not starting, but um, getting started with running ACE and maybe you would advise other entrepreneurs, what would that be? Because I didn't come from an engineering, manufacturing, business background, I always felt like kind of had a chip on my shoulder. And so the one advice I would give it someone is that just trust your guts. Follow your instincts. That's kind of a cliche though, right? Like it what, is, so but how it's does really it actually, true. Yeah. You know, it's really true. So at Ace Clearwater, um, our core value is we do the right thing. And we've empowered all of the employees here that whenever they feel they're doing the wrong thing, something's not right, mm -hmm. to stop the process, put our red flag up and say, hey, we got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. This doesn't feel right. So our core competency is do the, we do the right thing, but you don't always know the right thing. <laughs> right. But you always know the wrong thing. Mm. When the hairs on your arms kind of stand mm -hmm, up or you're mm -hmm. looking over your shoulder, you're not feeling good about yourself. So we're trying to encourage do the right thing. And mm -hmm. that means the wrong thing's telling you to go down a certain path. Don't. Speak Stop up. the process. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is your guts, your instinct, you know. Mm -hmm. We usually hold all the answers. We have the answers. You know, we got to listen to ourselves a little bit more and have that confidence. And I didn't. Like I said, not coming from a manufacturing background, I didn't really trust myself and felt that everyone else knew better. Mm. But I really had a vision. I really knew what I wanted to do and the kind of company I wanted to create. And I think people should not underestimate the importance of culture mm -hmm. in an organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, as soon as you walk in the door of a place, if it's sort of above board or not, people like each other or they don't, mm -hmm. if they're proud and committed of working there, and so, and no one can tell you what kind of culture your organization should have. It's got to be organic. It's got to come from the leadership. It's got to be about a place that you can feel really proud of and that you look forward to going to every day. Mm -hmm. And only you can define that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is that real nuance around the um, trusting your gut because I do think that a lot of pe a lot of times people naturally think, well, geez, what would so and so do in the situation because I'm not the expert. Mm -hmm. And I can completely see how mm -hmm. you might have felt that way. How did you Absolutely. get over that? When did you get it over? It took it? a long time. So I think about how long I've been doing this. <laughs> and if it, maybe I had done that earlier on, where we could be today. <laughs> well, so, but things happen for a reason, I truly believe. And, you know, we are where we are and super proud to be the president of this company and so incredibly grateful to the men and women that work here that um, are committed and want to make a difference and continue to make our industry strong. You're such an inspiration. Thank <laughs> you so much for chatting with us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks. It was so much fun. Wow, so many crazy stories. I think the three most interesting lessons for me were, first, as we all know, being an entrepreneur is not easy. <laughs> and a successful entrepreneur like Kelly does not give up. In fact, she's driven more when someone tells her she's failing or shows up with a bat in hand ready to do some damage. Are you the same? Second, if you're a small factory, don't be overwhelmed by Industry 4.0. Dip a toe in with one or two technologies and make it enticing for your team to experiment and make suggestions for how it can be incorporated into your enterprise. And finally, there seems to be some opportunities to make the aerospace supply chain more agile and resilient. For a company to have to spend a quarter of a million dollars to change out one supplier seems a bit rigid and fragile. Any ideas? By the way, contract manufacturing isn't just for big aerospace companies. Are you an entrepreneur with an idea for a garment or consumer product or an electronic device? Partnering with contract manufacturers can help bring them to life. 
If you're in L.A. next week, come to our Make It Monthly talk next Wednesday, March 22nd in downtown L.A. Visit makeitinla.org slash events for more information and use code CMX for a discount. There's tons of aerospace events the next two weeks, by the way, like the Drone Summit and a Switch Pitch event. So check out the regional calendar for more. Time to wrap it up for the art of manufacturing. Tune in next Thursday when we speak with Mark Fuller, the man behind the fountains of Bellagio, to learn how his company Wet Design continues to redefine the high-tech water fountain industry. Visit makeitinla.org for show notes and to stay in the loop about events, news, and resources. To chat with other like-minded manufacturing entrepreneurs, join our Facebook discussion group at makeitinla.org slash community. Never miss an episode. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play Music, or your favorite player. And if you like the show, do us a big favor and leave us a review. Or send us a message with feedback and ideas on Twitter at we Make it in LA. This podcast is produced by At Large and Dangerous in collaboration with the Make It in LA initiative and other partners. A big shout out to Peter Brandenburg, the producer and audio engineer, and our content coordinator, Heidi Carrion. Thanks for listening to The Art of Manufacturing. I'm Z Holly, and remember, don't just make it, make it.